have the sound to them, which makes them really fascinating to watch. I think it's the adding sound to these videos that gives them a visceral quality where they're almost contemporary. You feel like you know these people, even though the style of dress and their mode of transportation is totally foreign to how we get around today. And I'll include a couple links in the description underneath this video so that you can check out a couple. I really like the one from 1911 in New York City. Being new to this whole video thing, I've only been on YouTube for less than a year. I must say it's a rather steep learning curve to learn the lighting and the sound and the video setup and everything like that, editing and so forth. What really amazes me about these videos is that over a hundred years ago, using the technology that they had, they were able to produce films of this quality back then. Now I could watch these videos all day long, like having a time machine or a window into the past. What really strikes me though is the ability of the human mind for me over a hundred years later to watch this and to relate to those people. And I'm really a little sad to think that everybody that we see in these videos has long ago passed away. Now our ability to relate to them is partly based upon technology, being able to watch these films and videos of their lives. But there's a more important idea here, and that is we have this ability as human beings to understand another person based on narratives or stories about their lives. So when we watch these videos, we're able to relate to them because we're seeing little micro narratives about their lives, micro narratives that relate directly to our lives today as well. What I wanna to do today is look at this concept of narratives and how they fit with the human mind and how that relates to interpreting the Bible. So grab a cup of coffee and let's dive into this topic. So if you're new here, you're watching the Caffeinated Bible. My name is Dave, and for the past 20 plus years, I've been teaching in graduate schools and seminaries and doing theological research. The goal of this channel is to take as much of that as possible and put it on YouTube so that you're able to read and study your Bibles in a much more engaged and stimulating manner. So if you like it, be sure to subscribe, let your friends know about it as well, and it never hurts to give it a thumbs up or leave a comment down below. So let's see, where was I? Oh yes, narratives and biblical interpretation. Now it's often said that as human beings, we are storytelling animals, or as some people translate it, as homo narens, we are human beings that storytell. Who am I? If I were to answer that question, I would tell you a story about my background, where I was raised, my education, my family life. In order for you to know who I am, you would really need to know the story of my life. And the same thing when I meet you, I would wanna know something about you, your background, where you're from, how you were raised, because all of this information helps me to understand who you are, your values, what drives you, and why you're doing what you're doing now. Narratives allow us to create values and meaning, and they also allow us to understand someone else, especially their character. Now, what's interesting about this is narratives not only help me to understand you, but they also to help us to understand something within a text. So why is this important? Well, 90% or more of the Bible is in narrative form. And even texts that we would not consider narrative, for example, Paul's letters, are highly narrative in nature anyways. If you take a look at the letter to Romans, perhaps the text he's best known for, if you read through that, look at all the places where he starts telling you stories about Adam, Abraham, or Jesus. Pay attention to when he drops into telling you stories about himself, about other people, or about biblical characters, and you just see how much of his text, even these non-narrative texts, contain narrative material. I said in the introduction that we are homo narrans. We are human beings that tell stories. And we learn this from a very early age. Even before we're born, a baby learns to stick its thumb in its mouth and then take it out, and then stick it in its thumb and in its mouth, and then take it out. And it learns this trajectory or pattern of movement. My, my hand is out here, if I raise it up, I can stick it in my mouth. And what they've developed there within their brain 
is the ability to understand a proto story or a little micro story that if I move my hand from this position, it goes along this path and then it goes in my mouth and then, ah, that is so good. I get a reward at the end here. And in the process, this ability to stick their thumb in their mouth gets wired into their brain at a very early age. A few months later, we find ourselves in early childhood stages, sitting in a high chair with a tray in front of us and all these wonderful, exciting things on it. Spoons, cups, food, drool, all this sort of stuff. And you learn that if you pick up your cup, you can hold it in your hands and you can do with things with it. But then you begin to experiment. You hold it off the side of the table and you think, well, what happens if I let I'll be right back. Okay, so I should have learned that story and its conclusion a long time ago. But when a little child drops that cup off the side of the tray, they get to watch it fall, bounce on the floor, make a noise, see food go all over the place. They've learned a proto story. If they pick up a cup, hold it over the side of the table and let go, it falls and hits the floor. It happens every time. Point of this video is not to tell you how to break coffee cups or make a mess that your parents would get annoyed with. Rather, the point of this is to explore how narratives work and what we learn from them and how to go about reading and understanding a narrative. Now let's go back to that story of the baby dropping the cup off the side of the table. There are all kinds of amazing cognitive abilities that we are able to then use based on that proto story. The first one is prediction. If I hold a cup over the side of the table and let go of it, I can predict what's going to happen to that cup. If I see someone else doing the same thing, I can predict what's going to happen to the cup when they let go of it. I can predict not only what are the results of my action, but those of others as well. We are able to understand and make predictions off another person's actions. Evaluations. We can make evaluations off a story. When I drop that cup and it hits the floor, wow, that is absolutely amazing. It's incredible. Why aren't my parents amazed at this as much as I am? What is the evaluation that's going on here that they make regarding to that story that is different than mine? Or for example, my wife's. We can actually get a little bit more fine grain than this. We learn off narratives that there are actors, objects, and events. The child holding that mug is the actor. The object is the mug. And the event is what happens when that mug hits the ground. Actors cause the actions on objects, which then we call an event. And these allow us to make predictions and other judgments based upon what we see the actor, the objects, and the events doing. We can also make explanations or inferences off a narrative. So if I walk into somebody's house who I was young children and I see a mess underneath the high chair and their mug on the floor, my mind can immediately make an explanation that that child pushed or dropped its food off the side of its tray. I know the story, I know the results of it, and I can make explanations based on what I see. Even though I haven't seen the actor do it, drop the object or the event that took place. In his book, Louder Than Words, Ben Bergen relates how polar explorers would relate the story of watching polar bears on the hunt go across the ice. And when they got near a seal hole, they would start getting down and crouching and sneaking up on the seal hole. And when they got really close, they would put their paw over their nose before they caught the seal. So why am I telling you this story? Well, it's not to go into the evolutionary behavior of polar bears or anything like that. Why I'm telling you this is because you just did an amazing amount of cognitive processing in your mind in regard to that story. Notice if you go back a half minute or so and you listen to me telling that story, I didn't tell you anything about the color of the scene. You filled it in that the snow or the ice is white. You filled in that polar bears are white. You also filled in that the seals come up out of the water in the seal holes. And finally, perhaps the most clever detail you put in 
is the reason why the polar bears cover their nose with their paw. And that's because they have black noses. And you inferred off that, that they're doing that so that the seal can't see them. All they see is the white fur. We do a remarkable amount of cognitive processing off very, very simple stories like polar bears and seals. But we can also layer and combine stories together to create very, very complex narratives. You can take a simple story in the Bible, but you need to realize that story is within a larger book that's placed within the larger meta-narrative of the Bible. And so you start seeing how it gets very, very complex. If I take one of my klutz balls here, so if I hold it up and drop it, we have a very simple story. Start, middle, end. We have an actor, we have an event, and an action that took place there. But we can make that story more complex. We can throw the ball up in the air. But we can do something even more complex than that. We can take several balls and combine them so that now we have a very complex narrative with lots of events taking place here. In Psalm 121, the psalm opens with a very, very basic story. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Here you have someone who is standing there. They're looking down and they lift up their eyes and they see the mountains. Very, very simple story. But this then gets incorporated within the larger narrative that Psalm 121 is going to tell us. Murray Krieger defines it this way. He explains narratives especially ones that we really enjoy listening to or reading, as a window, mirror, window. Now, what does he mean by window, mirror, window to explain what a narrative is and how it works? A window is when we approach the story or the narrative and we begin to engage it. We either begin to read the story or like those videos from 1900, and we begin to enter in or enjoy that video or we begin to read that particular text. It's like a window that we go through into the world of the narrative. Here, once we enter into the story, now we begin to understand based on references and connections between actors, objects, events within the story itself. It's like this mirror cabinet that was up at the Denver Museum of Science that Leonardo da Vinci designed. Once you're inside that cabinet, everything that you see is a reflection off the different panels of mirrors within that cabinet. In the same way, if we go back to Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. And so immediately we can put ourselves in the context there of someone trudging along that road that's a long, gradual climb, so it's tiring, and it's probably incredibly hot and you might be out under the blaring Middle Eastern sun. This is not a propositional statement or propositional logic. It's based upon our being able to understand a proto story of walking along a route or lifting up our eyes and looking towards something. These are all little micro narratives that we have learned that allow us to enter in and make evaluations and projections off that particular story. We understand a character's actions, events, beliefs, thoughts, motives, based on all the reflections or correspondences that we see within that cabinet of mirrors. Now allow me to just push this a little bit further. One of the interesting things about narratives and our engagement with them is that in most cases, we enter into a narrative, what we would call media res. It's a Latin for in the middle of things. So if I show you this particular clip Watch what's taking place within your mind. You understand that you're in a plane. You're in the middle of this story and you can make inferences back and forward. You know that this person got into a plane at one particular airport, that they are now flying to another particular airport, that they are on a journey from one location to another location, and we are media res. We are in the middle of this story right now. I didn't give you the beginning or the end. We just dropped right into it and you're able to completely understand it. 
The same thing takes place in everyday encounters. You meet your friends at church or a coffee shop or someplace, and you know that they drove or they took some means of transportation to get there, but you're meeting them media res in the middle of this story. And because you are a storytelling animal, you understand the trajectory they took to get there. And you know that this meeting is going to end and they're going to go off to another location with or without you. These are all things that you are able to put together based upon your understanding narratives and stories. If we go back to Psalm 121, we can infer that they traveled from somewhere and they are going to Jerusalem, most likely to worship in the temple. We can make all sorts of references, even though we engage this psalm, media res, in the middle of this story, and no beginning is provided. We're just dropped right into the middle of this person's ascent up to Jerusalem, and we are called to enter and engage it as an act of worship. Window, mirror, window. We come to the final window now. As we come back out of the story, Krieger describes this as coming out of a window back into our world. But we bring that window with us because hopefully we've learned something in that story so that now when we look at our lives and those around us, the world that we dwell within, we're now seeing it through a new perspective. It's like we've put on a new pair of glasses or we're looking out a new window on the world. It allows us to make evaluations and judgments, but also project possibilities for our life or make predictions off what's going to take place or where things are headed. There's lots of other aspects and narratives that I'm not able to cover in this video. In fact, I made this video last week and it was a really, really, really good video. But then when I posted it up to YouTube, it was corrupted. So I thought, no problem, I'll get the back up and post that. That was corrupted also. I lost everything. Now, as I'm redoing it, hopefully I'm making a better video, but I've decided that I've crammed too much into that video and I want to extend it and do it in nuggets and then show you the relationship of each one of those to reading the Bible as we go through. Narratives allow you to make projections and possibilities and infer things. You can start making inferences and developing possibilities off what I am doing here. You're also realizing that I haven't made one of these in a long time. And now we've had a whole series of actions and events that this actor has produced and have produced this very, very fine little paper airplane. Now, I hope you find this study on narratives, which I've just introduced this week, useful. And if you like it, as I said before, subscribe. I will also leave sort of a bibliography of different works that I find fairly important on the whole idea of narratives and interpreting narratives underneath this video. So if you want to dive deeper, deeper in, you can uh, take a look at some of those. Until next week, peace.